hello world, what is up? Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Matt Forte. We are here live at the Build studio in New York City. 40% uh, of all households in New York struggle to make ends meet, and nearly 1.2 million New Yorkers don't always know where their next meal is coming from. City Harvest is New York City's largest food rescue organization. For more than 35 years, they've been rescuing nutritious food that would have otherwise gone to waste and delivering it to help feed our neighbors in need. And on October 29th, City Harvest will be hosting their annual signature fall tasting event. Joining me now to tell me all about Bid 2019 is the healthy cook himself, published and best-selling author and host of the epic table. Oh man, Dan Churchill is here. Guys, make some noise for Dan. He's amazing. This dude's awesome. He's right backstage. Uh, there you go. We're going to bring him out in just a second, but first I believe we have a video revealing the theme for this year's bid event, so let's go ahead and run that clip. Oh man, that's funny. Guys, make some noise. Dan Churchill's right here. Do it up. Let's go. Uh, dude, uh, congratulations. So, what a year, man. So many great things going on in your world. How are you doing right now? It's so exciting to have you here with us. Thanks, man. Yeah, it really is. And uh, I tell you what, if there's no more chefs left in New York City, at least we've got a good dance rendition sort of. There's a lot of good chefs on there, so uh, it's, it's good to see we got multiple skills. Uh, we were talking during that video, uh, hell of an actor, you're not a drummer. You're not, yeah, yeah. much less one that plays with spoons. Yes, exactly right. No, uh, usually around the pots and pans, but uh, not in the, uh, s the the drumming world. But yeah, no, I, I play guitar in my time, um, but there's too many things going on to add that as well to the repertoire, obviously, of things That's to do. That's background now. That's yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, so you haven't played guitar in a while then, huh? Oh, man, I... I actually got my guitar back over from Australia, but in the process of it coming over, it oh, no. broke. Oh, so God. it's hanging up. It looks cool. It makes it look like I've got some culture to me, but yeah, it doesn't work, unfortunately. It works more as a decorative piece Absolutely. at this point. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. a bummer. Well, you are quite busy, so I would be surprised <laughs> uh, if you had time to squeeze that in. Let's talk about what's keeping you so busy, man. Uh, this is super awesome City Harvest. Uh, you've worked with them before. It's not your first time. Yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit about what they do. For those that don't know what, what rescuing food means and what all that is. Yeah, so uh, I've been working with City Harvest for some time now. It's a, it's a fantastic organization where they, they do two major things that I love. Um, with my chefing and my mission, they, they by prevent food waste, which is number one. The second one is they feed those in New York City who need it. Um, and they do it in a way that there's a lot of misconception. As you talked about in the intro, there's a lot of people who we don't realize are actually uh, not getting a meal. Uh, and so they, they target those things. They find out ways that we can, as a collective, drive campaigns and awareness behind it. So as a chef in New York City, uh, you know, you, you generally want to get to a point where you're really making an impact. And so being on the food council amongst, you know, some really well-known chefs is a, a tremendous honor. And what we're doing here at City Harvest with the, the events, bid, uh, obviously the marathon and, and everything else we're doing, it, it's really exciting. Well, we're going to talk a lot about those two because uh, the bid and the marathon, I'm really excited about those. But um, you'd mentioned there are a lot of misconceptions uh, about how the process works and, and what they do. What, what is one of the biggest misconceptions about food rescue and, and, and what it is and what it means? Yeah, sure. So let's talk about like, um, you know, you don't have to be homeless to not be getting a meal. I think that's a big one. Um, you know, there's uh, 1.2 million people in the city who don't know where the next meal is coming from. Uh, one in five of those children are involved in that. But it's not someone on the side of the street necessarily who's in that situation. It could be someone in your apartment building. It could be, you know, your next door neighbor. Uh, and what we don't want to happen is a situation where, uh, you know, just like in, in, in the business world where marketing budgets get slashed, uh, the first thing to go is marketing uh, and then obviously have nothing to do. Same thing in the food world. As soon as, soon as your food budget or your, your cost of living budget goes, First thing to go is you generally will take onus and your kids hopefully would be the ones yeah. to get fed. But unfortunately, those people still don't know where the next meal is coming from. So uh, what Siri Harvest does is they look at ways that they can create awareness behind those things and obviously uh, facilitate an opportunity for them to you know eat them. So we've got agencies, soup kitchens and all those kind of things we work with. Um, but in order for that to happen, we actually have to get the food in general. Where does it come from? So this is what's interesting. Siri Harvest started working with restaurants specifically. So that's how the building of this relationship with chefs. It's really cool. Um, and after a while, we've uh, been able to get bigger establishments on board, such as Whole Food, Trader Joe's, uh, and a lot of farmers now. So to help support the farmers as well, we actually provide them with some stipends as they you know, may uh, have an excess in, in some of their, their, um, their goods as well. So we take those 
uh, those uh, you know, pallets of food and yeah. they do get pallets. I've personally been on a food run, which is an exceptional experience, where we'll go to these places, pick up the food and then transport them back to the facility, um, you know, which is currently in Long Island where it will be distributed throughout to the city uh, for agencies. And there's some really other cool things as well. We have these really cool markets, um, you know, that happen throughout the year. Uh, we actually get to engage specifically with uh, those we're supporting as well. So, you know, all in all, the money that's raised goes to a tremendous cause of facilitating that distribution channel and working with people who um, are able to either pick up or facilitate the drop-off. Uh, and it's, yeah, every, every, every money raised is going towards that opportunity. And to be clear, when we're talking about food rescue, we're not talking, we're talking about produce that hasn't sold for whatever reason. Maybe it doesn't look as good as the apple next to it or something like that. We're not talking about stuff that people took a bite out of and didn't finish. We're not talking about half-eaten meals. We're talking about food that's still good but just hasn't moved for whatever reason. That's exactly right. Yeah. You could get a broccoli head for some reason that's uh, maybe, you know, um, got a little bit of, an, you know, uh, something that's not meant to be on it kind of situation, but you, know, you cut that bit off or in other ways, it's, it's perfectly good food. 40% of food, you look at a whole broccoli head, if you look at almost half that broccoli head, 40%, according to USDA, is going to waste. Yeah. And so we take that opportunity and prevent that from happening. And, you know, obviously we're supporting directly here those people in need, but also we look at, you know, other current issues with sustainability and emissions and all those kind of things. And so we're targeting a bigger, you know, issue here, but while still making our focus on uh, New York yeah. City. No, and it makes a lot of sense, too. This is a really stupid version of this, but when I was younger, man, we had a buddy who worked at Dunkin' Donuts, and every night they'd throw out a whole garbage bag filled with perfectly good donuts. Nothing oh. wrong with them. They just didn't sell that day. Exactly right. We were gross growing up, <laughs> I just have to add. But uh, but that's a real thing. But I, I'm, I'm reminded of that because there is, there's so much, there's good food that's just out there that we're not moving, and, and without an organization like City Harvest, where does it go? It, it becomes literal waste. Exactly. It's an actual waste. Yeah. Exactly. So How'd you get involved with them, man? How'd you get paired up with City Harvest? Man, it's really cool. It's actually a tremendous honor. So um, I'm doing my thing. I moved over to New York City four, four years ago. Uh, four years already. Four years already. Yeah, it's been awesome. So I, uh, I got a book deal and I got a TV deal over here from uh, Australia. Yeah. Um, and I kind of just, uh, yeah, I, I, I kind of, I knew I wanted to be a, a chef who made an impact. Not in the case of a figurehead for Dan Churchill, but more a case of I knew that I wanted to change the world through food. I realized what it can do to people in communicating a message. And yeah, so uh, I, for the first two years, I just really knuckled down and worked um, really hard on building content, both uh, obviously across social media platforms, on, yeah. on the food networks and all those kind of things that really helped build my voice and message. Uh, and then after that, I knew I wanted to build a restaurant. So I launched uh, my first concept here with Charlie Street down in Olita, which is really cool. Um, and in that time, along with all the um, you know stuff that I was doing with these brands and uh, supporting support networks, uh, I got reached out to by, you know, City Harvest themselves, and they saw what I was doing and on the trajectory you know, I wanted to be, and they asked if I wanted to be on this food council. And I think there's some moments in your life where you, you know, there's, there's some key moments you know that you're on the right path, and when a, when a really cool organisation like that who is doing good reaches out to you to be helping them support, um, it, it's, it's gratifying because that means I know that every day that I get up to do what I do and uh, work with the team that I have to build this consistent message, uh, when someone else recognizes that and yeah. wants to be part of that, uh, it was yeah, it was a tremendous honor. Helps kind of amplify what you were trying to do. It validates what you were trying to do, all that stuff. It's good Absolutely. Stuff. You, um, you're a really smart dude, man. You got your master's and all that. People here are like, oh, he used social media. He did this and that. He took a shortcut or whatnot. But yeah. that, to me, is a really hard thing to do, especially uh, in the time that you've done it and how much you've achieved in the time that you've done it. What was your strategy going in in a world inundated with people trying to be influencers, trying to share their message, trying to share their voice in the world of food and in general? How did you decide to stand out? What was your strategy, man? Yeah. Yeah, really, uh, effectively long play, to be honest. Like, I did my master's degree in strength conditioning. So, like, uh, you know, before I was a chef, I was a strength conditioning coach working with athletes. So, I, I definitely had the ability to work with athletes, but also understand individuals um, and how we can accommodate them from the health perspective on practically applying food. Uh, and so, from that, I took that. And when I became a chef, I, I knew that there was a, a niche that I could obviously foothold onto. I knew that if I was to make an impact, I had to be consistent uh, with whatever message that I wanted to be. So consistency and know my values. Anything outside of that, I didn't you know, you know, stray towards. But the biggest thing, and I talk about this all the time with people, I'm not an influencer. I'm, I'm a chef and I have a brand. And as a result of that, Instagram, social media is a platform to distribute that message. But when I get approached by you know, companies to work with them, they see it from a holistic perspective long-term play of, uh, you know, potential opportunities to leverage 
a number of different mediums of what I want to do. So I never, I, I make sure that I don't do social media for, you know, financial opportunities. If I'm going to do things that are, are part of a company or a partnership, it's for a bigger play. It's to like, you know, work towards their mission uh, and look at other avenues, whether it be getting me on board to, um, you know, work with a company called, say, Athletic Greens or Under Armour and how we work collectively to make people understand what they can be doing you know, with their digital space to make them easier to do things. So, you know, I never look at myself as posting, posting, posting. That's just a platform for me to, yeah. to, to you know, talk about what I want to do. But at the end of the day, like, I, um, I just made sure I sticked consistently to what I believe in uh, and, and didn't stray towards that influencer side, just stuck to the brand of cooking healthy food. And that's, yeah. that's what I did. Remained authentic and waited for people to recognize Absolutely. That. And yeah. it's hard. You've got to be consistent and you, there are opportunities that come and you've got to learn to say no to them. And that's exactly what it is. What, what's an opportunity that you... You know, let's not go down that road. I'm no, 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 that's cool. I, I, I'm uh, curious because I, 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 that's a very important skill set to have to know when to jump and seize the day and when to say that's not the right time for me. Absolutely. I, uh, so, you know, like a lot of people in this city, they get to New York City and they, uh, you know, find themselves. So I'm from Australia. I came here. Um, I'm, when I first got here, I'm sleeping on people's couches to kind of get understanding where I'm living and everyone can relate to that, Right. Um, and so when big opportunities financially come around, you've got to learn to say no. And one of those was I, I got offered a source deal to be the face of a source brand, very large amount of money, and I said no. Yeah. And that, and the reason being is that it had sugar, it had all these things in it that I'm not a big fan of. It's not you. Yeah, it's not me. Yeah. And the reason is if I took that opportunity, the Under Armors, the Athletic Greens, you know, these are the companies that come along who are there for the long term to support your mission. Yeah. Uh, they realize what you're truly in for. And so they, you know, give you big opportunities, but they know your message, you know, and it wouldn't have made sense. Yeah, it wouldn't have made sense. Uh, well, talking about organizations that, that align with what you believe in what you do, working with City Harvest, we saw that video, we were joking about <laughs> it, that you were drumming and dancing with the spoons and whatnot, but yep. it's for a great event. It's for, for the bid event, which is this year's coming up, uh, and, and just tell us a little bit about what that event is and, and what it's for and, and, and what that video was. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so, um, firstly... I apologize. Uh, <laughs> no, it's, it's an amazing event. So this year bids, uh, you know, theme is Studio 54, hence why we have the dancing. Go. Okay. Yeah, exactly. There Just to, go. There's the background. Um, and this event is, a, is New York City's premier tasting event. You have some of the biggest chefs in the world um, at this event providing opportunities for the, those who come to taste their food, meet the chefs. We're talking like the Eric Repairs, uh, the Jeffy Zakarians of the world. Um, and last year we raised enough money to feed 18,000 families for an entire year. So, like, that's the kind of impact we're having. An entire family for a whole year, 18,000 of them. And so um, there are tickets still available for this year. Uh, and I promise you the dancing... Oh, uh, you know, the dancing may actually occur because it is Studio 54. So, yeah, it may, may go down. Yeah, exactly. Better so bringing your spoons. Yeah, oh, I'm doing it. Don't you worry. <laughs> so if somebody, uh, you can go, you can get tickets right now uh, and people can still be a part of this event. What, what, what can they expect? They go, they get their ticket, they go, what, what's going to happen there? There's going to be great food, maybe some dancing. You're going to be there? Yeah, I'm going to be there. Uh, and there's some really cool events you can be part of. You've got the actual chefs themselves to meet. There'll be, yeah, I think there's 50 plus chefs um, of all different types of amazing nature here that you can all be influenced by. You taste these specific foods from their restaurants. Uh, and then other items up for opportunities as well to be a part of as well. So you can just go to cityharvest.org and uh, get yourself a ticket from there. Very cool. Uh, another great thing I said we were going to talk about, we have to talk about, this is the seventh year City Harvest is uh, uh, partnering up with the Marathon. Yep. And not only that, you're the team captain this year. <laughs> Hold for applause for the team captain right now. We've got to... Not everybody gets to be team captain. <laughs> that's, a, that's a cool thing, man. That's really, really cool. Uh, how many marathons have you run? Because I saw your vlog. You ran, I think, last year as well, yeah, right? Yeah, I ran yeah. last year's marathon. So that was my first. That was your first one? Yeah, this is my first second. First marathon period or first New York City marathon? No, first marathon period. Oh, dang. Yeah, and then I went to the Barclays. Uh, I, went, I went to, what did I go afterwards? I went and watched a, a, a Nets game afterwards. It was tough. <laughs> you were done. Uh, yeah, I felt like I had to be that guy that everyone had to sit, stand up for when they went on the subway. I was that person. It was great. <laughs> That's insane. What you are generally, you are the healthy chef. You are a fit dude. You got your master's in exercise science. So how, do you train for a marathon? What does that look like? <laughs> You're already in pretty good shape. Yeah, like, how sure. do you get ready for a marathon? Uh, great question. I, uh, firstly, due to the people I work with, I have uh, many resources to you know, call upon, uh, coaches, uh, you know, nutritionists, all those kind of things. But yeah, I generally have a bit of information um, understanding myself. So training for a marathon is a lot mentally, um, you know, I guess, uh, specific. So you are trying to, you have to build up your, uh, your body's ability 
to run 26.3 miles. So two weeks before the marathon, you should switch off. So right now I'm tapering. So I did my long run, uh, which can get up to, you know, 20, 21 miles. So you'll do a 21 mile run, how far out? Two and a half weeks out. Two and a half weeks out, yeah. 21 mile, and yeah. then you start tapering down? Exactly. So, but in that week, you do fast pace stuff. So you do like a 10 by 800 meter sprints uh, with a rest. And so you do all these, what they call anaerobic movements, so sprint or faster pace movements with rest, and then one long run a week that will uh, challenge your body to put yourself in the position to run two and a half hours or three hours. Like, you know, you really, when you're running for that long, you're really getting to know yourself. And training is probably the hardest thing. I, uh, I actually, so... I listen to my podcast. Yes, I do listen to my own podcast. And you I, listen to your own Yeah, podcast. I do. I, just, I always do it to check with the team, like, oh, we missed this or that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah. Um, but I, I love my guests, so that's, that's awesome. But, yeah, you're on your own for three hours or whatever training. So that's the hardest thing. But I will say it is a really good way to get to know a city. So I've, I've really understood, yeah. And with that, I've also got my food down pat, so I understand. So yeah, how's your diet change at this point? Um, I've got a very clean diet in general. Uh, flavor is the most important thing, so you can't, you know, substitute to tastiness but um my carbohydrate I'm, I'm big on uh, eating carbohydrates for myself that's what works for me it's not everyone but i increase my carbohydrate intake throughout this period along with some uh, good fats for my immunity because when you're generally training a lot more your body's uh you know its immunity starts to drop off so you, i eat good fats i have my ag i have greens in the morning and um yeah it's it's a really good opportunity for you know sustaining colorful ingredients so i'll be eating like Four to five meals a day, plus snacks, plus some, um, plus a protein shake or two if I need to, depending on it. But uh, I already know it's. I've got a, I've got a good bunch of mates who are running it, and obviously we've got 50 people with the City Harvest team, and everyone's welcome to come to Charlie Street the night before and have a big pass to cook up. So that's pretty awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's the fun thing too, right? Is that there's tons. So that huge team that you're the captain of, it's a bunch of chefs and a lot of people, a lot of restaurants are doing tie-ins. They're doing marathon uh, drinks, marathon meals and stuff. And all of that's going to City Harvest. Yeah. It's pretty so cool. Throughout these, this next month and also some for next month, we have um, you know a couple of the chefs, so myself, uh, we got Marcus Glocker from Augustine and, um, and, and also Seymour's. We're all putting on um, a dish on our menu and proceeds of that dish go towards raising money for the marathon. So we're aiming to hit $250,000, which will feed 1 million people. Uh, and so every dollar that we uh, can raise obviously goes to a great cause. And so if you go to Charlie Street, Seymour's and also, uh, also uh, Ed's Lobster Shack as well, shout out to Ed, he's a good bloke, uh, and Marcus's restaurants. Um, you know, it's, it's an amazing opportunity for getting those dish. And you can find out more of that at cityharvest.org as well um and each each of those dishes will uh donate some proceeds to charity yeah cityharvest.org great resource in general if, if you're if you're watching this and you're, and you're not in new york or whatever and you want to give or be a part you can go to cityharvest.org and you can donate i think it's for every dollar it's like uh, nearly four pounds of food or something like that yeah, it's, it's incredible uh, it, it's incredible the the return on your investment there and what you can do to, to help people out even if you're not uh, here in the city right now. Uh, we're going to go to some audience questions. I think we sure. got one coming to us from Twitter. Uh, the first one here at jhays88 says, is there something specific that you are bringing to the table for this project as a chef that goes beyond what the average good Samaritan would do? That's a really good question. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's something you always look at. How do I as a leader and already be part of City Harvest go the next mile? So uh, we talked about Charlie Street um, obviously providing good funds. Now I'm uh, organising a, a night at Charlie Street to actually fundraise uh, the money that we need. And and to be honest, I have some partners who I call upon to like the – you know, the brands that I work with already, uh, I'm working with them directly to see ways that we can add extra value to these causes. The biggest thing that I can do as a point of difference is my time. So, uh, you know, going to these food rescue facilities and bringing more people there um, or being opportunities to promote like today is what I always want to do. I've said that to Jacqueline and Gregory and the team at uh, City Harvest. Biggest thing that I'll always do is you're my number one when it comes to fundraising and uh, it's always going to be that way. Great question. Can, can I do one in the room? I want to get one from the room if we got a microphone. There you are. Hey. Go for it. Uh, I have a two-part question. The first is, um, do you have any guilty pleasure foods? And <laughs> what are some uh, healthy alternatives to curb those cravings? Yeah. Um, this is really bad. Like, this is – you're going to be so disappointed. My guilty – It's not going to be a garbage bag of donuts, so oh, I've already set the bar no. pretty low, buddy. I wouldn't I, worry. <laughs> I, I, look, I love chocolate and all those things as much as the next person. My guilty pleasure, as bad as it sounds, is roasted cashews. I know that sounds – yeah, I know. Everyone's like, come on, man. guilty pleasure. I know. See? Everyone's just drizzle like, something on there? Yeah. You're going to give me, like, a sauce or something? I just can't get – the problem is I have, like – I have them at the restaurant, right? And we roast okay. them, and they've got to hide them from me. 
because if they're there roasted, I will have the two quarts. What are you gonna, let me ask you this: post race, 20, 20 uh, yeah. miles, you do the marathon. What, what are you gonna? What's what's waiting for you there? What meal is waiting for you at the end of a marathon? <sighs> you gotta you gotta go a little crazy there, right? I uh, last year I smashed uh, I think three burgers and about three servings of sweet potato fries. There you go. I'm okay to double down on that. Um, <laughs> there's that. I, I mean, I love my spaghetti bolognese so much, which I'm having the night before. I may just make sure I have two batches of that the, for the two days. Uh, yeah, look, I think all game. It's all game on after the marathon. I you get this bag of goodies at the end. And like, I don't think I read the label. You just chuck it into you. And, and, and here's my piece of advice to anyone doing the marathon. Do not sit down when you finish. It, 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 you will not get back up. Or if you do, you're going to need a crane. So, yeah. <laughs> you had, uh, speaking of guilty pleasures and healthy alternatives, I was looking at your Twitter feed and there was a, uh, I'm excited to try like a fried chicken recipe that you oh. had up there, like a baked. Man. That looked pretty good. Yeah, we had this, uh, oh man, we, this is this has actually gone real mental. We had it on an episode of the podcast as well. And it's almond crusted yeah. nut so fried chicken. So not not so fried, not so fried chicken. It's really simple. All you have to do is get your get your chicken thighs, boneless, or you can have bone in, and um, put them in some Dijon mustard. Uh, and then in a separate section, you have your almond flour, maybe some thyme, some rosemary, and some salt and pepper. Uh, so you go from one section to the, the, the almond flour, and then put it on a tray. Uh, hopefully the tray's got uh, you know some aeration, not directly onto it, but if you don't, no problem. In the oven, about 325 for about 50 minutes, and you have... I think that's, you can check it out. You see this beautiful, golden, crispy, looks like a fast casual restaurant's very well known rest, uh, uh, chicken, but it's almond crusted and it's a game changer. Yeah, it looked really good. I'm yeah, excited to cheese, give that a shot. Uh, all right, I got to wrap things up. Before we get out of here, cityharvest.org is where everybody has to go to check out how they can get involved, how they can be a part of this. Uh, you've got your podcast uh, right now available on iTunes and on, on your YouTube channel as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the Epic Table. Uh, I read somewhere you got olive oil coming out. You working on that? Yeah, still? man. That's coming out proceeds as well going to be donating to uh to uh, uh, city harvest so yeah it's going to be like the endless bottle of olive oil you're going to be able to pick it up and uh if you need more just be keep it coming so it's a it. back and refill yeah exactly that's cool man that's no wonder cool. you're not playing guitar you're busy dude <laughs> well you're not busy enough that you couldn't come by and say hi i appreciate you being here man thank you so appreciate much it. thank you for you guys for coming and hanging out and being a great audience uh cityharvest.org check it out get involved be a part of the solution thank you so much again to dan churchill right here do it up thanks guys